earth is needed to be financially comfortable. Again, ages 21 to 75 were asked this. What net worth is needed to be financially comfortable? The average answer was 1.4 million. They asked another question. They said, what net worth is needed to be wealthy? To be wealthy. Well, it's got to go up, right? It's got to be more than just comfortable. The, com the composite answer was 2.4 million net worth to be wealthy. They then asked this question, what does it mean to be wealthy? Here are the top three answers. Living stress-free. Number two, I can buy anything I want. And number three, loving relationships with family and friends. Now, I'm thinking the apostles might have had a different answer. I think their list might have looked somewhat different than this list. My text this morning is Ephesians 3.8. That's going to be our launching point. Ephesians 3.8, where the Apostle Paul says, To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. My title is True Wealth, Part 1. We're going to hone in on this pregnant phrase, the unfathomable riches of Christ. Inscrutable wealth and treasure. Unfathomable has the idea of beyond tracing out. Unable to fully discover. Impossible to reach the bottom. Paul, as he comes here in chapter 3 and begins to talk about how the mystery has been revealed that this gospel is equally accessible to Gentiles as it is Jews. And a Gentile is just simply everyone who's not a Jew. Everyone who's not of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the majority of us in this room. And he is rehearsing that God had called him and saved him and given him grace to preach to the Gentiles, to evangelize the Gentiles with the very good news of Jesus Christ. Christ crucified, Christ buried, Christ risen, Christ returning. And Paul went all over the known world with this message, telling people how they could be saved from their sins and have eternal life with the living God. And he was blown away that God had chosen him and used him in this way. And so he says here in verse 8, to me? I mean, it's almost like we're hearing him go, can you believe this? Can you really accept this? To me, this person who was a Pharisee, who hated Gentiles, who considered them dogs, and now he's going to spend the rest of his life with them. <laughs> and now he's going to call them his brothers and sisters. He says, to me, the very least of all saints, all holy ones, this grace was given, this grace of ministry, this grace of preaching. To proclaim to the nations, to tell the entire world about the inscrutable, unfathomable riches of Christ. So here we are in chapter 3 and verse 8. So what might Paul have had in mind by these riches of Christ? Well, we don't have to look very far other than what has come before chapter 3 and verse 8. My argument for you this morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is this. Our spiritual riches, it's very simple. <laughs> Our spiritual riches in Christ are unfathomable. They're inscrutable. And therefore, we ought to be awestruck by them. We ought to be blown away by them. We ought to be humbled and lifted up and made thankful and made grateful. Our spiritual riches as believers in the person of Christ are unfathomable. Here is exhibit A for your consideration. We were hand-picked for salvation in Him. Look at chapter 1 and verse 4. So we'll be in chapter 1 this morning, thus the scripture reading. And we're going to find these spiritual riches 
that Paul has already been discussing. He says in verse 3, he starts this great section praising and worshiping God. Blessed be the God and Father, for He is the ultimate source of all of these blessings. And He's blessed believers with every spiritual blessing. There's not a single spiritual blessing that you have not been blessed with as a believer. If you are united to Christ, you are united to every spiritual blessing God can possibly give from the moment of your conversion. And he begins to rehearse these spiritual blessings. And you notice in verse 3 that they are in the heavenly places and they are in Christ. You cannot find a spiritual blessing outside of Jesus Christ. Right? Right? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. There is no other way, no other religion, no other truth to find a spiritual blessing. They're all monopolized in the person of Jesus Christ. And then he begins to unpack them in verse 4, just as. Speaking of spiritual blessings, number one, he, God the Father, chose us, selected us, elected us, where? In him, in Christ. When? Before the foundation of the world. Why? That we would be holy and blameless before him. There's the what, the when, the why, and the where. All in verse 4. We have been handpicked then for salvation, but this happened in Him. And that's what I want to hone in on, is the in Him part of this, because all of our spiritual riches are found there. This is surely a reference to something that happened before the creation of the world. This is a reference to something that happened before Genesis 1-1, where in the eternal counsels of God, God the Father, in eternity, looked at God the Son and said, I love you so much that I want to give you a love gift. I want to gift you a people. A people that will be conformed to your image. A people who will be made like you. I am so proud of you. I delight in you so much that I want a mass of people who will be conformed to your moral beauty and excellence. And so God the Father in eternity past gave this love gift of a redeemed humanity to his son. The son had to agree to receive the gift and the son had to agree to redeem the gift. He had to agree in the eternal counsels of God that he would accept this glorious and gracious love gift of the Father, that love gift being a redeemed humanity. That is surely what Paul has in mind here when he says that God the Father chose us, and he did so in the realm of Christ, in the person of Christ. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 6 if you want to see some support for this idea of this love gift between the Father and the Son. John chapter 6 verse 37. Here Jesus is speaking and he's going to make reference to this gift in a context of salvation. He says in verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. He's talking about people. He's talking about sinners. He's talking about people who make up part of this love gift. And he says, not most of them, not 95% of them, not 99% of them, but all of them. Who? That the Father gives me. That's what qualifies it, right? It doesn't say all will come to me, does it? Because all will not come to him. But it says all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out? Well, of course not, because it's part of the love gift. For him to cast out one would be for him to despise this gift that the Father has given him in eternity. Look at verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, it's already happened, all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. That's speaking of that resurrection to come where we are conformed to his image. And so he's, a, he's referring to the gift the Father has given him. 
He is dedicated to not losing even one single person who is among this group, and he will, in fact, raise them up to eternal life on the last day. And jump over to chapter 17 of John, in what's called the high priestly prayer of Christ. In John 17, he makes many references to this love gift. So not only the words of Jesus here, but now this is Jesus praying in John 17 right before the cross and he says in verse 2 he says even as you gave him so he's referring to himself now in third person you is God the Father him is the Son even as you gave him authority over all flesh uh, that's over all mankind that to all whom you have given him he may give eternal life you see none are dropped off none are lost All that were given to him, he then gives eternal life. Well, we know that not everybody has eternal life. And so we can deduce then that not all people of all time were given to him. Right? See verse 2. Even that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Look at verse 6. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. Here now is the direct reference to his disciples. Uh, the, the 12, he says, uh, I have uh, manifest your name. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. And look at verse 9. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask. I do not ask on behalf of the world. But of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And then verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So how do we understand this idea of God selecting, God handpicking, God choosing a people for his son in this love gift? How do we understand this? This great, great doctrine of election. Perhaps we can illustrate it this way. It's as if God looked out on the quarters, down the quarters of time, and he looked out upon all of humanity, and he saw them on the other side of the fall. He saw them on the other side of their rebellion against him, which started in Adam and Eve. And it's as if God looked upon this mass of all humanity, of every single person who would ever be born, apart from his son, of course. And where does he see them and how does he see them? Well, he sees them with their backs to him and they're on a death march and they are intentionally and deliberately walking away from God on the broad road to destruction. And they are rebelling against him and fleeing from the light of his holiness. And there they go. It is a mass exodus of humanity away from God. And out in the distance, there is a cliff. And at the bottom of that cliff are jagged rocks of justice. And every single one of these sinners is intentionally walking off of that cliff to destroy themselves on the rocks of justice. And that's what God sees when he sees humanity. Romans 3, no one seeks God, no one is good, no one is righteous, all have turned aside, together they have become useless. God looks out at fallen humanity and he sees nothing but rebels running from the light destroying themselves on the rocks of his law and justice. And if God were to do nothing, he would be just. If God were to do nothing, he would not compromise his holiness or his righteousness. But God is also a loving God and a kind God and a gracious God. And so he decided that he would pluck out of that mass of rebellious humanity individuals based on his own will and his own good pleasure, not based on anything in them. 
Not based on their goodness or what they might do or what they might not do. It had nothing to do with them whatsoever. It's all bound up in his own good pleasure. He handpicks a group of them to become this love gift to his son. He sets his love upon them in advance, and he chooses them for salvation and did so before the foundation of the world. He will have mercy on whom he has mercy, and he will harden whom he hardens. See, God is sovereign over salvation, and, and, and those who go on and go off of the cliff cannot accuse him of being unfair because they're getting exactly what they deserve and exactly what they want exactly what they want, which is to get as far away from God as possible. And those whom he chose can only boast in him because they had nothing to do with it. And they weren't even in existence. This is how we might illustrate then what Paul is praising God for in verse 4 of Ephesians 1. These are part of the... In, I told you they were unfathomable. <laughs> I told you it was incomprehensible. Right? This is what he's talking about here in verse 4, just as he chose us in him. So what should be our response as believers to this great truth, to this, to this diamond in the crown of the incomparable riches of Christ? What should be our response? We ought to blow the roof off of this place every Sunday morning. That should be our response. We should sing so passionately, so loudly with our hearts and with our minds that figuratively we blow the roof off this place, we should be singing so joyfully that when Toby comes up here to start his call to worship, we should be thanking Toby, I don't need no call to worship. <laughs> Let's worship, right? We should come in so ready, so eager to, to sing the praises of God for the salvation He has wrought in our life that He rescued us from that death march and that broad road of destruction. We should be singing so passionately that Toby cannot hear himself sing up here. Singing with all of the strength, all of the ability, all the might that you have. Think of it this way. That when we sing praises, because that's what this is. This is praising God for the glory of His grace. When we sing praises, it's our way of saying thank you. It's our way of acknowledging. Salvation is of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, be, come behold the wondrous mystery. Thank you, God. You see, singing praises is how we check our portfolio to see if the riches are still there. And we sing it as well with my soul. Yeah, they're still there. We sing Amazing Grace. We say, yeah, they're still there. You see, we check our portfolios online. How's my, how's my mutual fund doing? How's my pension doing? Our singing is that kind of checking where we rehearse what God has done for us. Second application of this first truth is found right there in our verse. Look at it, verse 4. Look at it with me. That we would be what? I can't hear you. That we would be holy and blameless. Now this has a couple of meanings. It's both positional and practical or in practice. It's going to be true ultimately. It's true right now in position. But I think Paul has in mind as you go through the rest of the book of Ephesians that he means in your day-to-day -day life. So another application of the doctrine of election is simply this. We would seek to live a holy and blameless life before God. Listen, if you do not long for holiness, if you do not ache for holiness, if you do not pursue holiness, you do not understand the doctrine of election. Not in the least. This doctrine makes you so grateful, so thankful, so humble, so desirous of, oh, I want to please God with my life. Look what God has done for me. And I long to please Him with a holy and godly life that says no to sin and yes to God on a day-by-day -day basis. There's really nothing worse than someone that thinks they understand the doctrine of election and lives a godless life. What a lie that is. So as we begin here with Exhibit A, there'll be three this morning for your consideration. I just want you to see that your riches, your spiritual riches in Christ this morning 
are unfathomable. Do you understand why God chose you? <laughs> no, you do not. <laughs> because it's all bound up in his own good will. Exhibit B. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I present to you Exhibit B. We were predestined to adoption through Jesus Christ. Predestined to adoption through Him. Look at verse 5. In Him... No, verse 4 says, in love, verse 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Predestined to adoption. Now, predestined has very much the same sort of idea as chosen before the foundation of the world, right? Right? Predestined means he predetermined. It means to fix a, a, a boundary or a, or a horizon in advance. It's to determine something in advance of it happening. But what I want you to see here in verse 5, more than the word predestined is the word adoption. Adoption. You see, as God looked at humanity going away from him, he looked at people who were rebels, who were outsiders, and he says, I'll, I want to adopt some of them into my family, but they're all outsiders. And, and so he's going to adopt us through Jesus Christ, who is the only true insider. See, we're all lost in our sin and rebelling against our God, but Jesus is the natural born son. Jesus is the legitimate true son. Jesus is the one who is the true insider with the Father. And so, if he's going to adopt us out there and bring us to himself, he's got to reach through Jesus to do it, and then he brings us to himself through him. And this predestination is not some cold, formal fatalism. It's not. It doesn't mean that we turn into robots or machines without a will and without a response. It doesn't mean that. This predestination, look at it. He did it in love. That was the motive. That was the driving force behind God. In fact, nothing could be more loving than for God to adopt a people to be his own family. This is the essence of God's love and action. In fact, J.I. Packer in his classic book, Knowing God, he speaks of adoption as really the greatest of all spiritual blessings. He makes a good argument that adoption is really the end of the gospel. It's really the point of the gospel. That everything that God did was so that he could be a father to us as sons and daughters. So that we could come to his house and to his table and to his heart. <laughs> See, adoption means God, God brings you home. He brings you to his bosom. He brings you to his table. He spreads a feast for your life. He brings you to his family. He brings you to the church. And one day he brings you into heaven where he will dwell with his people. God as what? Father and they as my sons. This is the fulfillment of the new covenant. And it's all wrapped up in this idea of adoption. We may think of it this way. Jesus is the only adoption agency that God the Father will work with. So I want you to think about two things as a result of this second exhibit. I want you to think, first of all, and be reminded today that you were not just predestined. You're predestined to adoption. And you had no right to this adoption. You had no claim to this adoption. But God reached through Christ, and he brought you to himself. And in this adoption, he gives to us every blessing and every inheritance that is rightfully Jesus Christ. There is one legitimate and true son and the rest of us are adopted into this family. And so I want you to know this this morning from this. You are loved. You are loved. 
This is God's expression to you because he did it in love, in affection, in unmerited favor, in kindness, in love he predestined you to adoption. So we always say, well, if, if there's any doubt that I'm, that I'm loved, I go to the cross, absolutely, absolutely. But here's another reason to never doubt that you're loved by God. <laughs> because he claimed you as his own. He wants you as his child. Not just his servant, not just someone that escapes hell, not just someone that's going to go to heaven. He wants you as his son and as his daughter who knows the heart of their father and is close to him as it ought to be. So that's the first thing I want you to revel in this morning, this, your love, because this is according to his kind intention of his will. But here's the second one, and I think they work together. I want you to be humbled this morning. I want you to be humbled and laid low this morning that your adoption through Jesus Christ was predestined and predetermined and you had zero to do with it. I want that to humble you and lay you low this morning before God. I want you to ask yourself these questions all the time. Why was I predestined to adoption? Why me? Why me of the mass of humanity running away from God? Why was I not left on the street to die in my sin? Why was I given a seat at the table of the king when all I deserve is a hole in a garbage dump? Why? I, why? So the message this morning, we think about adoption and predestination. The message is simply this, you know, for all of us, get over yourself. You know? <laughs> Just get over yourself. You're really not all that. You're not great. You're not. I'm sorry. I'm not great. You're, you're, we're not. We're, we're nothing. We're nothing but rebels who deserve a garbage dump for eternity. And we have a table and a seat at the king's mansion. I mean, what did Paul say about himself in Ephesians 3.8? If Paul, if Paul is the least of all saints, where does that leave you and me? We need to go around saying all the time, I'm the, I'm the least of the least of the least. I'm the least of all saints. We need to treat each other like I'm the least of all saints. You're more important than me because I'm the least. I'm the littlest. I'm the most insignificant. I'm the smallest. If Paul can say this, the greatest missionary ever can say this. If Paul, the great apostle, can say this. Do you realize what he's saying in that? He was a Pharisee. He was a Jew. He considered Gentiles dogs. And now he is saying that he is below every Gentile believer there is. And he is blown away for his entire life that God would give him the grace to preach to these former enemies the unfathomable riches and love of Jesus Christ. What a model he is for us. So get over yourself. Get over your pride. Lay your ego in the grave. Leave it in the grave with the old man where it belongs. Every day you need to get up and die to yourself. Die to your pride. Renounce your pride. Hate your pride. You need to put yourself down low, low, low. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might lift you up. And these truths help us do this. When we say, wow, he chose me before the foundation of the world, and wow, he predestined me to be his son or daughter. Third exhibit for your consideration. As we cons consider the, the argument that our spiritual riches in Christ are unfathomable. Exhibit C, we are redeemed and forgiven in him. Look at verse 7. We are redeemed and forgiven in him. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished on us. I was going to make these two different points. Redeemed would be a point and forgiven would be a point. But I've combined them because Paul combines them. And I've combined them because the first one is the basis for the second one. It is the redemption that makes the forgiveness possible, right? And so I've just wrapped them up into one exhibit and we are redeemed and forgiven in him great lyrics of a song we sing often i am forgiven because he was forsaken i'm accepted he was condemned there it is 
There's the forgiveness and the redemption wrapped up into a song lyric. I'm forgiven because he was forsaken. I'm accepted because he was condemned. You see, this word redemption means bought with a price. It means to buy the slave off the slave block of sin. It's as if we were standing there wretched, filthy, dirty, naked, and we're, and we're bound with handcuffs, and those handcuffs are actually our sin, the sin that enslaved us. And there we sit with nothing to offer God but our sin. And He comes and He buys us off of that to be His own. He redeems us with a great, great price. He bought us then at the price of His own life. We were ransomed by the blood of Jesus, by the life of Jesus. And all of this ransom and all of this bleeding and all of this suffering and especially that dying is what makes our forgiveness possible. We may think of it this way. God set the price for our redemption and then paid the price to himself by becoming the price in Christ. It's as if God looked at the mess of mankind and he said, I have to do everything myself. Yes, you do, God. As Augustine famously said, God gives what God requires. God gives what God requires. He set the price, he paid the price to himself, and he became the price in Christ. So let's go back to our adoption as orphans. You know what? We weren't cute little innocent baby orphans. I'm not talking about that kind of orphan. We were wayward orphans. We were street urchins, right? Thugs. We were conniving, manipulating, lusting, stealing our way through life, deceiving and being deceived, hateful and hating others, killing, stealing. We were just manipulating and working the system. We were just, we were just bad people. We were dirty. We were filthy in our minds, in our words. We were wayward orphans. And every sin we committed was against a good and righteous judge and a good and righteous king. And in fact, these sins that we were committing as these wayward orphans, as these street thugs who were running loose on the streets, these sins we were committing were personally against the judge. It was as if we had egged his house, smashed his mailbox, mocked his rules, hated his kids, we were those kind of orphans. They were all against him on a very personal level. And so now there's a conundrum. You have a righteous judge who says that all crimes against me must be punished by death, but he's also a loving judge, and he wants to adopt the orphans into his own family. He's got a conundrum on his hands. I want to adopt them on the one hand into my family, but on the other hand, their crimes must be paid for by death. So he did the only thing he could to accomplish both. He offered up his innocent son in their place. It was the only possible way to accomplish both ends. Sin must be paid for with death, and my love wants to adopt these and bring them all the way to myself. And so in this redemption of Christ that is the basis of our forgiveness, God did everything that was necessary so that he could adopt us into his family. Our sin was the barrier. The barrier is removed. All of our trespasses, look at it in verse 7. We have been bought through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, plural, all of them. That's where we violate God's standard, violate God's law. That's lying, stealing, cheating, lusting, fornicating, adultery, murder, hate. That's dishonoring and disobeying parents. That's delving into pornography. That's doing illicit drugs. That's every breaking of the standard of God that a person can do. He says that we have been forgiven of our trespasses. We have been pardoned. The slate is clean. They're all washed away. They're gone forever because Jesus bled and died on a cross. You have no sin in your life that can overcome the death of Jesus. You have no sin and no guilt that his blood cannot take away forever and ever. This is the glory of the gospel. 
I ask you, look at verse 7, this redemption through his blood, this forgiveness of your trespasses. I ask you, what is this worth in U.S. dollars? Well, the answer is whatever the life of Jesus is worth. That's why they're unfathomable riches. Let me pose this question to you. What if you owned Amazon, Google, and Facebook? Would you qualify as rich? But what if you weren't content because you didn't own Microsoft and Apple? Are you still rich if you're not content? Are you rich if you have the slightest inkling of greed? Well, you own Amazon, Google, and Facebook, so you go out and buy Microsoft and Apple. But you also wish you owned ExxonMobil and Disney and Pebble Beach Golf Course. What if you owned the whole world, but your eternity would be in a tub of hot lava? Were you ever rich? Did you ever have true wealth? The answer, of course, is no. The answer is a resounding no, because all of the money in the world cannot touch your guilty conscience. And all of the money in the world cannot buy forgiveness of even one sin. And all of the money in the world cannot make you whole before God. And all the money in the world cannot give you Christ and assure you of heaven. But the blood of Christ can. The life and righteousness and death and resurrection of Christ can. This is why I said at the beginning, I mean, what is 1.4 million in light of this? That's what it takes to be financially comfortable? That's what it takes to be wealthy? I don't think so. No, our spiritual riches in Christ are truly unfathomable. They're inscrutable. Here they are again. You were chosen before Genesis 1-1 to be holy and blameless before God. You were predestined to adoption as sons, and you were redeemed at the cross and forgiven of all your trespasses. And the great glorious truth here that Paul wants us to see is that all of this happened in and through and because of Jesus Christ. I'll say it this way. If you don't have Christ, you have nothing. If you have Christ, you have everything. On March the 9th in 1843, Pastor Robert Murray McShane wrote a letter to a grieving church member. They had lost a loved one, and they were hurting under the providence of God. And he wrote them a pastoral letter to admonish and to comfort and to point them to Christ. And at the time of writing this letter, Robert Murray McShane was 29 years old. And in fact, he would die himself 16 days later. He said this in the letter. He said, you will never find Jesus so precious as when the world is one vast howling wilderness. Then he is like a rose blooming in the midst of desolation, a rock rising above the storm. Let's pray. Father, may it be that you would help us all to find Jesus, this rock rising above the storm and this rose blooming in the midst of desolation. Lord, in this world, we will have trouble. In this world, we will have desolation. In this world, there will be crime. There will be sin. There will be death. There will be tragedy. But you have overcome the world through your Son. God, may we find our peace in Him today. Father, may it be that uh, through the course of time, we do find this world system to be a vast, howling wilderness. And through the course of time, God, may we find Jesus to be more precious than he's ever been. God, remember what my second pastor would say many, many times. You do not know how much Jesus is worth until Jesus is all that you have. We pray today, God, that there be somebody here that bow the knee, bend the knee, confess their sins, come to you and you alone for forgiveness because Jesus paid it all. We ask it in his name. Amen.
Amen. Would you stand with me and sing?